life and death are the fundamental questions we have, right? I've talked about life before. I made a video on what is life. But at the most core part of a living organism, beyond the complexity of a human being, and as far back into the birth of life on this planet, we have a function of organisms, of, of collections of matter, right? It's collections of atoms that form into chemicals, that form into compounds like proteins and carbohydrates and all the little bits of a cell that collect together in a sort of self-organizing, bottom-up emergent process that creates something that is what you might call self-regulating, um, error-correcting, self-error-correcting, in that whatever environment it's in, uh, there is an attempt to stay in the same form that the recipe that the organism was given at birth, that it, that it came into the universe with, that recipe, which is entirely unique, unless it's a clone, Although even some clones, I imagine, at some point can pick up changes to the recipe. But uh, when it's born, there's a unique set of instructions that, that are a recipe for how to continually keep that system some sort of stability, some sort of equilibrium. And it occurred to me a funny way to talk about that was to call it a soup a self-organizing soup that wants to stay made up of the same preferred ingredients, the same kind of soup. So if it's a, a carrot sesame miso soup, it wants to say a carrot sesame miso soup and not become some other form of soup like tomato or minestrone. So it's a, it's a self-correcting soup right? Now you normally see a soup and it doesn't correct itself. You can throw in whatever ingredients you want and it'll stay whatever those new ingredients are. But a living soup, like a red squirrel, for example, a living soup is self-correcting. It fixes its recipe. No matter what you throw into it, it's going to try to stay whatever the soup is it wants to be and not whatever soup you want it to be. So it's sort of error correcting. And that's an interesting way to think of life that I hadn't thought of before. And it's very appropriate for me to think about right now because my mom currently is in the late stages of dying, basically. She's, it's a complicated voluntary um, the way she chose to go out and it's sort of assisted suicide, but it's the kind that is entirely legal and always has been, or at least has been in most parts of the world for a long time, I imagine. It's basically just, you just kind of sit there and let things happen. There's no interference and you're not being given anything that you don't want to be given. It's just you and the air for as long as you want to input and output the air. That breathing is the last thing pretty much that your body does. All the other systems start to shut down. Your body dehydrates. You're no longer taking in nutrients. And it just slowly shuts down more rapidly, depending on how you feel about this. Uh, without water, the body can go maybe around around 10 days. It can last a, a fair bit longer or be much quicker, depending on the environment, obviously. 
um, in a normal hospital room. That seems to be the average of about 10 days that it takes for the body to fully shut down and stop breathing. And my mom is going through this right now. It's been about a week since she stopped taking in food and water. And they are giving her some uh, medication <laughs> to keep her happy. She's getting morphine, which is as she chose for for a long time. She has this were, was this were these were her wishes from maybe a decade ago or a little less. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when. I think it was 2014 when she wrote the first paperwork, uh, uh, her advance directive. Um, and this is entirely legal and and apparently quite normal in in um, hospitals. So I've been watching this process and thinking about this. You know, what is the difference between living and dying and death? And not being born, of course, too. Um, and the main difference seems to be it's a set of traits. It's a set of patterns. An organism has a preferred recipe. My mom's recipe is unique, as are all of our own human and squirrel and tree genetics. The recipe that we're given at birth, and maybe occasionally get some afterwards, there's something called uh, horizontal gene transfer. Um, may happen with viruses. I mean, in our bodies, we may somehow adopt those. I mean, human being, human genomes include things that used to be other things, um, including viruses. So, there's some some of that, uh, but the majority of it, at least with us animals, is that we're literally just born with these genes that have the recipe to make who we are as individual unique soups. So my mom's soup is her own particular collection of traits and preferences and the ingredients that make her up. Everything from loving performance, uh, drama, singing, just entertaining other people, storytelling, her entire life has always had that as something she really cared about. She just loves giving new experiences to other people. Um, ideally ones that are, you know, enjoyable or educational for them. She was a teacher and she was a dra uh, professional singer and drama theater person. Um, and she also did some buying and selling stuff. So she, she did a lot of uh, yard sales. Uh, she would buy things and she'd talk to people at the yard sales and then get things from them and get their stories. And then she would have her own yard sales or sell things at auction. And she would, again, see other people and tell them her stories or the stories about the thing that she was selling them. So in almost all of her life, she was performative, expressive, and that was her, her priority uh, was to be giving something unique to other people, usually information, a story, something like that, emotional experiences, gardening. She absolutely loved gardening, especially flowers, but she also did vegetable gardening. Uh, the flowers tended to be less likely to get eaten by critters like squirrels and birds and things. So she, I think she felt a little safer doing the flowers. Plus you other multiple people can share the joy of seeing flowers. You don't need to pick them necessarily like you do vegetables uh, in order to enjoy them. So that was, you know, that was a big part of her recipe. Um, and there were other things in it too. You know, there was some addictive personality. Um, and there were, you know, she was short. <laughs> and she liked being in the outdoors and in 
uh, I mean, she loved living in the city when she was younger, but she, the, she preferred living in a more rural environment when she could. Uh, but she loved walking. And that would happen anywhere, wherever she lived. And that was when she had, well, every single time she's had her strokes in the past, um, she credited walking, especially in nature, but just walking all the time, as much as she could. Every day she would get up in the morning, as long as the roads were clear and not icy. Um, even in the dark, before the sun came up, she would just go out for a walk for, you know, a good mile or two, usually. So that was in her genes. That was in her soup. Those were the ingredients of my mom. And now that she's dying, her body is not able to self-correct. She's not able to take the things in from her environment and reorganize them in a way that forms the mom soup. There's still some of it there. She's still able to put some of the stuff in. The air that she's inhaling is still turning into parts of her with oxygen going into her blood system. And that's still feeding a, a little bit of the ingredients in my mom. But most of the stuff is not being turned into that anymore. Um, she's had many, many strokes in the past. Well, it's hard to say, but... Um, month and a half ago she had another major stroke and then started to get a little bit better but then started to get a whole bunch of strokes and um, the kind of stroke that she has is not your typical kind that's like blood pressure oriented necessarily it's not like a clogged artery or something um, it's actually a hemorrhage in her brain um, the, the blood vessels um, are either too weak or were compromised or maybe there was high blood pressure but she doesn't have high blood pressure, so probably wasn't that. Um, it was probably just that it was too weak. And um, maybe genetically, maybe due to alcohol, maybe just random life events, maybe just getting old, um, the blood started, you know, flooding into her brain, and that starts a cascade of negative effects that actually cause more strokes, um, more hemorrhaging in other parts of the brain. Um, so at some point, about a week and a half ago, uh, actually, no, it was a week ago. Um, she just started having so many of these that, that it was decided for her uh, that she was, they were not going to go to any extreme efforts to help her survive because most of her brain was just not functioning anymore. It was not my mom's soup. The ingredients were not being created. There was no, there was less self-correcting it was just sort of doing whatever the environment was doing to it instead of regulating the metabolism the way she always had done. So this is the most basic form of life. Again, this isn't, this isn't the complexity of life, which is this reproduction of patterns out into the universe and, and, and um, evolutionary process, not that you know, complexity part of life, but the most basic part of life, which is literally just this process of similar to gravity of nuclear and atomic forces bringing matter, shapes, patterns, whatever you want to call them together into certain patterns that form chemicals that tend to stay together and tend to work with one another to form patterns that tend to stay together. So it's this self-reinforcing, self-correcting, self-regulating, self-assembling process of complexity of patterns that stay in a form, a sort of balance, um, an equilibrium of sorts. It's peak entropy because it's so complex, it's far more complex than if the, if the soup was dead, right? If the things weren't self-organizing, it would be very boring. It would be low entropy. And it would be easy to turn a soup into something else just by putting in something interesting, different into it. 
But once it's, once it's self-organized, once it's alive in the most basic sense, even a virus, like right at the borderline of what is life at the, at the most simple state, it's this self-correcting, error-correcting preference for staying at some kind of equilibrium balance of what it is, of what it prefers to be, some sort of recipe. And that when you input new things into it, it either changes them into the ingredients that it wants, or it gets rid of them. So when we inhale the air from the atmosphere, which is a combination of different chemicals and gases, uh, we take in parts of it that we want and we reuse them and make them into other things, especially the oxygen. We make them into our body, into the ingredients that we have in our body, whether that's loving to be a theatrical person and wanting to grow flowers, or it's wanting to make a podcast and talk about philosophy and the meaning of life. <laughs> that's the difference between the non-living soup and the living soup. It's this high complexity balance of high entropy um, patterns that reorganize the outside into a preferred pattern, the genome, that decides the ingredients of what kind of soup we are. And so we get to do this self-correcting, self-organizing process for as long as, well, as long as we're designed to, and as long as the environment supports it. But because the entire universe is, or at least could be said to be alive in this same sense, that it is self-organizing, it is self-correcting, it is self-regulating, the universe itself as a whole is now high entropy and that means that it has a preferred state and that means that the things that it's flowing around that are they're I guess being input <laughs> if there are things being input into the universe um, in a sense it's probably a closed system, but it's not a closed system in a weird way. It's both. Uh, so it's self-regulating, self-correcting, and, and that means change, high entropy. And that means that we living organisms, like we animals and plants and fungus, fungi, which I could see a fungus right over there, one, one mushroom growing off a dead tree. I can see some trees and I can see, uh, what are these things? Uh, wintergreen leaves and the sun. The sun's not alive. But all of these things are inputs into the universe. And so the living universe itself is reorganizing these things into its preferred recipe, the preferred ingredients of the universe, which is sort of what we're trying to figure out what that is. I mean, it's hard enough for us to try to figure out what we as an individual human being want. Like, what are our preferred things? You know, it took me 30 plus years of my life to figure out what I wanted to do with my life and figure out all the ingredients that I wanted to make me up. But then we got to figure out what the universe wants too. What are the preferred ingredients in the universal soup? Right? Well, I guess that's our project. While we're alive, we contribute part of that experimentation of figuring out whether something is an ingredient 
that the universe wants as is, or if it's an ingredient the universe doesn't want at all and we just sort of let it go away, or if it's a, an ingredient that needs to be modified somehow. So I guess that's our, our role in life, in the universe, is to figure out what goes where. <laughs> what does the universe want? And how can we help it get what it wants, where it wants, and then let the stuff that it doesn't want just sort of go away, get removed, pooped, out into non-existence, I guess. <laughs> and my mom, right now, is getting reorganized. I don't believe she's entirely getting pooped out of the universe because we will continue to remember her and take on her stories and her information and memories we'll keep and we'll keep doing things that she likes to do for the universe like planting flowers and teaching kids to tell stories and just generally being an expressive person who wants to you know, have others enjoy things that we offer. Plus her matter, her material resources are going to be used by the universe to do things. Her various minerals and everything will turn into something else. So while she may be dying, her, you could say, spirit will live on many of the patterns, the stories, the ingredients, the preferences that were my mother will still exist just in different parts of the universe. She won't be alive anymore as my mother, but her preferences, her ingredients, her stories, memories, the things she's created and put out into the world, given to the world as gifts, many of them still remain and will continue to be used for a long time. And that's gonna happen to all of us. I love you, mom. Goodbye, but you're still gonna be here, right? Namaste.